Well, welcome everyone to Live from My Drum Room. I have a very special show today with my dear friend, David Wasikinen, drummer for the Hooters, an old friend going back, we realized, 35 years this year, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about David's long tenure with the band The Hooters going back to 1980, and uh, also talk about um, a side project or a project that he has called In the Pocket, which is very exciting and interesting to me, and I think it will be to you as well. All the great music that came out of Philadelphia, which is his hometown, and uh, we're going to play some of that music as well. It's going to be a great show. He's got a lot of energy, this guy. He's a great drummer, a great friend. And uh, I'm really, really excited to bring him on the show. So please welcome, without further ado, David Wasikinen. Hey, John, how are you? I'm great, buddy. Good to see you, David. Great to see you as well. Thanks for Here taking some time out of your Sunday, buddy. Thank you. I'm kind of walking around like everybody else, daylight saving time. Ugh. Yes. <laughs> we were just talking about that. Yeah. Yikes. You know, the well, I turned 68 uh, a couple weeks ago and... You know, like every bit of daylight I get, I'm happy with now. <laughs> I'm, I'm Give me another like, hour, man. I'm Let's go to three hours. You. Right. I know, mm -hmm. but I was just, it's funny how I think as we get older, like losing that hour, it's a lot harder to sort oh of bounce goodness. back. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah. You're right about that. But I do appreciate it. I really like, you know, I spend a, uh, uh, we're getting ready, my band's getting ready to go to Europe uh, in June. We do it like every year we spend, you know, at least six weeks over there and and most of the places we play uh the sun doesn't go down you know it's like you know yeah. you have to close the curtains to get to sleep you know you open the curtains at 3 a.m 2 a.m it still look, it looks like three in the afternoon you know so that's wild I, man yeah it is wild you know they're my people the fins you know but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are uh... My Crazy bunch, I, those Finnish people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say, we took a cruise. It would have been now, I guess, 2015. We took one of those, uh, a Viking sea cruise into the Baltic, oh. throughout the Baltic uh, region. And so it was in June. And I remember exactly what you said. It was like two in the morning. We'd look out the window, the, the our cabin and our, and our boat. And, um, <laughs> And yeah. it would be light out. It was the freakiest yeah, thing. Was, but we were ex yeah. like, we were excited to see that. We knew that would be the case. We're like, wow, this is incredible. So yeah, indeed, yeah. yeah, that was that. That was a crazy thing. I used to go there when I was a kid. Uh, I mean, the first time I went to Finland, I was I was 11 years old, and it was the summer, and it just didn't get dark at all, you know. And uh, I had some <laughs> crazy relatives, man. There, <laughs> sauna, <laughs> beer, and sunshine, you know. <laughs> Oh man. So oh, but I, I love it. I love yeah, it. Yeah, man. Yeah. And 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 um that's great to hear some some family background. Born and raised though in, in Philly, right? Were you actually yeah, born I in was. Philly? Yeah. Or outside? First, of, gener yeah. first generation American. My parents came over. Um and uh, my dad somehow ended up, you know, I, I was like, thinking about that one day, you know, because he came over to New York City. And I think he got a job as a dishwasher or something and worked in a soap factory and then he was building houses for Levitt in the early 1950s and then uh sent for my mom they got married in finland a year later came over and i was born and you know I, i'm really happy to be like living in the time that i lived you know getting yeah. experience the beatles and all that kind of stuff you know unfortunately those 60s were pretty turbulent but that, that whole idea of being able to see the beatles and the stones on tv when you were i was uh, i don't know probably nine nine ten years old when they were on the ed sullivan show and it was just like boom like yeah. for everyone else, you know, that like what, what, what just hit us, you know? Well, I, I remember us talking about this a long time. You yeah. telling me yeah. how affected you were by the Beatles. And I oh, made a yeah. note of that, in fact. Yeah. And I was going to ask you if you remembered about how old you were when you saw yeah. them. So you think really young. And was that, was that, would you say that was the spark that made you want to play music, play the drums? Yeah. Well, that was one, one of them. My dad, who isn't a musician, but, he loved music in Finland. He would always go see, you know, when anytime a jazz artist, Duke Ellington or Count Basie or Harry James or anybody like that came over, he would try to see them. So there was a place near where we grew up called the Lambertville Music Circus. So, he, you know, when I was a kid, he would drag me out to, you know, bring me out to shows, you know, and like Count Basie, all those artists I mentioned. Yeah. And so I, you know, I was familiar with that and he loved it. I could tell you once he, he wanted to take me to see Duke Ellington. And I said, no, I want to go build a fort. You know, like a kid. Uh, I look back, go, what? 
<laughs> but but yeah, uh, yeah, but that was my first, you know, that and then see, you know, seeing the Beatles, uh, it just, I, I still, remember, you know, I, I remember I had the flu, I had a really high fever. My mom said it was like, like 102 or something like oh, that. Boy. It was spinning, but you know, I still remember like it stopped, you know, and and I, you know, I'm not even sure if we had a color TV then, but I just remember thinking everything turned to color. <laughs> you wow. know, yeah. see the Beatles, yeah. man. And I remember yeah. my mom went and bought a little record player, and then um, you know, uh, I think we had we had something we were li- my dad was listening to records on, but I remember her buying a, this portable record player that we sat on a on a on a table and we would listen to the to that that 45 over and over again. Me and my two sisters, I had two younger sisters, and. You know, we were just knocked out by it, as my parents were. My mom was like over the moon over the Beatles, you know, yeah, so yeah. Uh, it, it, was, it moved me to, you know, and I remember I started pestering my dad. I don't even know, like, the, I, I uh, just wanted to play an instrument. You know, I wanted to do that. And I had a friend of mine who moved in the neighborhood that had a guitar and, you know, and there was a drum, a drum, there was a snare drum on a stand with a little, I think a little cymbal over there. I went over, he could play what I say on guitar and uh, I think wipe out. And I got <laughs> the drums and I could play a beat. Boom. I started playing that beat. I became the drummer then and I've been the drummer since, you know. Wow, man. Just yeah. That kind of thing, you know. But, no lessons. So you just self taught, just, just. Well, no, but I took lessons later. You know, once I got in school, you know, uh, they, they offered some lessons with. I, I, I actually took, picked up a trumpet first. My parents, because my dad loved Harry James. So yeah. you're going to play the trumpet. So um, I, I played the trumpet. I, I, and maybe I would have kept on playing the trumpet. I thought I broke it. You know, I didn't realize that you had to, you know, uh, use the oil, the valve, you know, the valve with the valves on the trumpet. I didn't sure, realize yeah. that. when I got the trumpet, I had it for like three months. And I remember one day I, 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 the, 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 uh, I couldn't, you know, it wasn't moving. Yeah. Right? I'm going, yeah. What's going on here? And, uh, I, I thought I broke it. So I remember bringing it back to the school, you know, and later on, I realized when I started, because I started playing trumpet a little bit later that I didn't break the thing. You know, I just didn't want to cost my dad like $300 at the time. You know? And then, and then drum lessons became available. I had a, uh, Mr. Marchman, he, he taught all the instruments. He was the guy that, uh, I mean, I remember I had a drum pad. It, it, it was the, you know, I'm sure you remember these things. It was like this oh, yeah. wooden pad with, a, with a pad piece of rubber on it. And I learned to play a five stroke roll, a seven stroke roll and a nine stroke roll. And uh, that was it. And then there was a guy, there was a music store up the street. My mom got me some lessons there with a guy and, uh, and then so on. And, you know, I, I would take lessons, you know, when we could afford to t- take lessons and yeah, yeah. get a paper round, I had to work to take the lessons and stuff like that. But, you know, uh, I, I, I wasn't really thinking, it, it, I don't even know if I looked at it as a chore, which is like, it was something I wanted to learn, but I still remember, um, uh, when my teacher, Bill White, was to remember, he brought in a record, he brought in uh, a Terry Reed record, uh, um, at which I think at one time he was going to be the, 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 he was going to be a singer in Led Zeppelin, and he brought in Led Zeppelin uh, one, and he had it on the turntable, and we were playing, I just like little black Ludwig kit, but I remember I was playing a Peisty Ride cymbal, it, it was, you know, I didn't even know, back, to, back then it was, it was uh, yeah, because we're going back, oh, it was probably like 60, 65 but anyway i was playing along to yeah. like a Led zeppelin to a record and you know it's like crazy There's no headphones or anything just trying to try my best to keep up with bonzo <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's I, I, I did the same thing playing i didn't yeah. have like played my stereo really loud yeah. in my room and played along yeah. to the records yeah no headphones back then but yeah i mean i yeah. didn't know any better i mean it was just primitive i i didn't know any better and it's just like we were that's garage great. bands and we were real garage bands we went in the garage and you know, a friend of mine would bring over an amp and then we would just play and, you know, kids would come in front on the driveway and watch us play. And I don't know what we sounded like, but sometimes we say we sounded good. Next yeah. thing you know, yeah. we move up to another band and, and uh, you know, I end up joining a band in high school and and then it just started like, you know, I, I for me, I remember I was about 16 years old and I was, I was playing in a bar in New Jersey and I made $300. This is going back like what 1972, and I was like, "Holy crap!" You know, wow, uh, this is what I'm going to do. I found my calling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, yeah. I had a six pack of beer underneath my floor, Tom, and I was making three hundred dollars a week to play. Uh, we're doing cover songs. Was, yeah, yeah. Uh, isn't it? I know. Isn't it wild when you go? It's like, crazy. Wow, 
I love doing this and I can actually make money doing it. Yeah, I know. It's totally, you know, and, 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 you know, there were girls, it was like, oh my goodness, you know, and I was, I, the drinking age just turned 18 and I, I was, oh my God, you know, I, I was, they had to drive me and sneak me into the bar. That's how we, <laughs> you know, it was, it was Great. good stuff. Yeah. But you know what you said, right. and, and what you said at the beginning, David, is so key because I'm a few years younger, but we're really from the same generation. And to have those opportunities we had as kids, like playing as teenagers, yeah. like school dances, yeah, clubs, bars, oh. um, yeah. you know, like, because I, I say this all the time, but there's still gigs out there, but not like it was when we were kids, like it high school kids. Like it. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, there, there's no school dances anymore where... Yeah. 15, yeah. 16 year old kids go out and play yeah. in front of their classmates, you know, and, yeah. and uh, I still remember there was a, there was a guy, you know, you couldn't even do this anymore. There was a bus driver. He was kind of a crazy guy. And he was this African American dude driving the bus. And he used to wear this, like, sometimes he put this chicken hat on and driving <laughs> the kids around the school. We were like, well, and I remember he had a guitar in his, in his bus. Oh, and wow. one day he, I, I was, I, I, I'm, I couldn't drive, but he asked me, he said, you know, can, can you, you know, you heard I play drums. So can, can, can you come play uh, drums for me? And I remember all we did is like uh, uh, Chuck Berry songs. And we did this gig and he paid me like $50, which $50 back then. I was like, are you kidding me? Wow. You know, 50 bucks. I, I couldn't be, believe I was getting paid to do it. And uh, and I remember that, you know, getting, because he was he was an adult, you know, he was like, yeah. you got a job to drive kids around. Can't do that anymore. I mean, to like, he asked right. me to come play with him. So, uh, you know, I remember doing that gig, gig and uh, yeah, I mean, it, uh, the bands in school and I, everything that happened to me, I just feel like I got very lucky, <laughs> you know, it's it just, just lucked out and been at the right place at the right time. You know, even with the Hooters, you know, getting into yeah. Hooters, it's like I was in a band. I was, I was in bands already it was made, that were making records, you know, a couple of, you know, radio records and things mm. like that, they got on these compilations. So I was getting around a bit, but I was playing in a bar in New Jersey and Eric and Rob just did the baby grand thing with Rick Murata, by the way, Murata played on their record. Oh yes. And, you told me this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, never enough, which is to me, it's like my Asia. I hear that. I'm like, Oh my goodness. I mean, Murata, Murata kills this track. And, um, but I remember they, 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 the band broke up and, uh, um, I remember Clive Davis signed them. They he, he, he dropped them, and then he they came out to this bar we were playing, and they, I think they, I thought they were looking for a lead singer, and they said, you know, I was playing drums, and they asked me if I'd come over to their rehearsal place and cut a couple tracks for them because Eric was trying to get into a film. So I remember I cut there was an animal song, and they, we did, and then she kissed me, and please don't let me be misunderstood. Was that one of them? There were four yeah. songs that I cut with them, and I packed up my drums. You know, because they, you know, they asked me to cut this to the studio, I packed up my drawers. I said like three words to them. They said, this <laughs> weird kid came over, cut these songs, like cut them, I threw them in my car and I left. And Rob said, to this day, he said, you never said anything to us. You just played and you left. <laughs> they scared the shit out of me, these guys. They scared me to death. I was like, oh my God, what am I? And they both went to Penn, University of Penn. Man, I was lucky to get out of high school. You know, I was like, holy <laughs> crap, you know, I'm playing with these two guys and, and, um, you know, and, uh, and I think they, uh, you know, a few weeks later, they called me up and asked me if I'd come, you know, play some of the original songs with them. And that worked out. I was playing with two other guys in a band that Erica would come sit in with once in a while. They end up being the other guitar player and bass player. And that's how we formed, you know. Wow. Crazy. Crazy. It was just like. Yeah. Yeah. Looking for a singer. They found a crazy drummer. <laughs> and that was 1980, David? That was. Uh, that was. Eight, yeah. It was probably. Yeah. Because we started in '80, and uh, that, that was—I uh, think I told you the story. You know, when I was walking through the parking lot, and Eric goes, "Well, you know, we got a name for the band." <laughs> oh yeah, what's the name? He goes, "The, the Hooters." I went, "What? How do we tell my friends the Hooters?" You know, it's like <laughs> what? these guys like we're making records. You know, Cindy Lauper would say the band with the unfortunate name. <laughs> <laughs> it's her lot to this day, but you know. It stuck well, though. It, you know what I mean? It's stuck. It totally, totally. <laughs> I mean, it looks good in print, you know, but then, uh, I remember when they, when they asked me, when they told me that I was just like, oh man, my friends would be, what's the name of the band? I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> they named a restaurant after you guys. So that's yes. pretty impressive. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it was like, and they, and later on the restaurant would want us to do, um, 
we should do promotions together. We're like, no, we're not going to do that. Come on. You know, you think we a jet with the Hooters on it. I'm going, stop. You know? <laughs> Yeah, maybe if they licensed one of your songs and paid you guys some some real money, that's yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. But they they weren't going to do that. I mean, those corporations yeah. they're all they're going to want to do is like wring your neck and whatever they do. Yeah, man. yeah. So yeah. man, let's let's talk about that because I mean, I'm such a fan of that band as you know. When I first met oh. you, you yeah, I, I, 1989. I mean, you guys yeah. were on tour with with Stevie Nicks that summer yeah. and. And uh, I was so I we'd never met, but I was excited to see you. And and the the band is you guys are so great live. I mean, so much energy. That's our uh, thing, you know. Yeah. I mean, we I you know to this day, um, it, it it you know we just play we love we, we love playing together. We all like each other, which uh, you know for forty four years, you know we still get on. And uh, you know, as from day one, I think that's the way it works. You get in there, and somehow we all just connected in a great way and uh and for us any time that we were like even making records um you know it's like get in the studio and and just you know they the eric and rob are the main songwriters you know we've all had a little piece in helping out with the songs a bit but those guys are like our lennon and mccartney you yeah, know so sure. you know they, they, they drive the ship and um you know they come into the studio and we still like are that band that plugs in and records that way and it just works for us and so the eye contact and that kind of thing yeah you know but, like but i still remember player. meeting you i still remember that that day because we were out with uh with stevie and one of my favorite and another uh uh i, we, I saw uh, james taylor on the flag tour um i guess it might have been it might have been 1976 or something and uh, I, I i remember thinking it was it would, uh, russ kunkel leyland sklar um, Danny yeah. Kuchmar, Wadi Watel, and uh, and of course James. I forget the Don Grolnick was playing piano, and I never heard it. That was one of those moments where, like, holy cow, man, the drum and Kunkel was so great. And so the way great. he played around the drums, and you know, he was a you know in the pocket, but he had this, you know, it was almost like he was dancing over the toms. It just sounded just yeah amazing to me. So uh, when we went out with with uh, with Stevie that year, having Kunkel on drums, I got to watch him every night, hang with him. It was terrific. But I remember he was playing those black heisty cymbals. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I was playing, I was the you know, Zildjian guy. And, and I, I remember I would tell you, he said, he said, hey, they almost sound as good as Zildjian's. Remember what I was saying? <laughs> I remember, we, well, we were- I you and I, you went, did he just say that? I know yeah. we were sitting having dinner and I think Russ came over. You introduced yeah. me to him, I think at one point yeah. and, uh, and he, he came and sat with us while we were having yeah. dinner and chatted and he was so nice. And, and he yeah. said something like, I, I like these cause they remind me of my old Zildjian's. Yeah. And I went, yeah. Yeah, I could, I could, I could, I could help you with that. I, could. <laughs> I, know. I was wondering like, Hey man, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, uh, he, was, yeah, that was a, yeah. that was a great moment. That was, um, certainly I've never, yeah. we haven't, we haven't forgot that one. That was, yeah, what is that? that was Great Woods, right? Was that that's right, band? Great Woods. That's right, right it's outside, right outside still of Boston. There. It's, it's, it's still, still there with there. a. It's, it's had about five name changes. It's the uh, Xfinity Center now, I think, but um, but it's still there. Yeah, like everything else, it's like yeah. nothing's uh, it's never the stays the same. As long as that menu's still there, that's that's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah I played there a few times. You know, we were we opened for a lot of bands in the, in in the in the U.S. I mean, you know, we've always had more success in Europe. But in the U.S., we opened for a lot of a lot of great bands, and I got to meet a lot of great, great drummers and become close to you know, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Brian Adams and Mickey and just you know, yeah. You, yeah. I know you and Mickey are very tight. I, I remember listening to a podcast, your podcast, when you had Mickey on. Yeah, and people I was a lot of with Mick. I was laughing hysterically, David. The whole yeah. people and it, people need. I'll put the link in there when I put this up on YouTube because. Yeah. They should check out your podcast first of all. Fine. You were it's, my guest. You were a guest I, on my I, podcast. I, yeah, you I was a guest, but it's my my episode wasn't nearly as good as Mickey's because you you yeah, guys yeah. just oh. had this thing, man, where yeah. it's just hilarious. Uh, it's like a comedy <laughs> show. You know, oh, Nick lost God. his calling. He could he could have been. I mean, at one point, I think they were trying to get him for Saturday Night Live to be in the cast. He was he's that funny. He's that, that funny. I, oh yeah. my goodness! I mean, so that quick. guy. Got, yeah. So quick, I mean, one, first of all, the most amazing drummer. Yeah. Plays. yeah. And then he had that mind and the things that would come out of him would be, 
be like. Like I remember once um, the late, great Tat, Pat Torpy was like, they were, I, we were oh. doing a gig out on the green and uh, uh, we were all kind of huddled up there because we were seeing each other and there, everybody's talking about, you know, what are you doing? And this guy's, well, I'm shedding and he's here and like, I'm shedding this. And, and Mickey goes, I'm tool shedding, you know, like cutting my grass. What are you doing? <laughs> He, he used to talk about his his sit his rider mower that he'd go home and just oh he's crazy about yeah. like lawn tools yeah that's just loving thing. doing he about rakes and shovels and that's his <laughs> thing gravel what kind of peat moss is that you know that's <laughs> Mickey <laughs> I got to tell you one quick funny Mickey thing too I remember it was like at a Nam show mm. um, he happened to be there hanging out we were having lunch at one of the little places there. And they had just, Brian Adams, Brian Adams had just done like a little tour with the Stones. This would have been like the mid or yeah, late remember 90s. That. Remember that oh. they did like a, a run with the Stones? Yeah. And we were talking about Charlie. We're talking about, you know, playing or something. And he, he said, he, he said something to the effect of, uh, yeah, you know, oh. Brian Adams, you know, we, we call the below average white band. <laughs> That's the one I was just trying to remember. Not so average white band, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Below, below average white band. Below average white band. <laughs> That was Mickey. And you know, Mickey, yeah. yeah. You know, he had an opportunity. I said, so he said, Charlie, I said, did you meet Charlie? He goes, yeah, he came in my room. And I said, well, what did, what did you say to him? He goes, I couldn't talk to him. I said, like, I was just complete, like, he, he just, he just couldn't talk to him. He was so, like, I was am amazed by that. You know, oh, Mickey said, that's so funny. Which is so kind of cool, you know, he was just yeah, so humble. Yeah. Charlie. You yeah, know? I know. And that's Mickey. He's, he's, you know, he's such a, like a, He's he's outgoing and funny, but he's also very. You could see him being oh. very respectful of Charlie's like oh. space or whatever, you know. Yeah. Oh, Mickey, Mickey was unbelievable. Like he was, he knew that when I did my, my that tour, I did we did with Brian Adams was my first sober tour. I mean, before that, I was raised in a little hell, because you know, I got you know, I got into some drugs and alcohol for a while, and it was like really kicking my ass, but, you know, especially the drug thing. And then when I went to uh, went on that tour, I got better. I got you know, you never get quite better, but I was. I, I remember going on that tour. Mickey's brother had a similar situation, George. So Mickey embraced me, and I met his whole family. And you know, they were great. They would even we, when we would do gigs. I think we were playing at Toad's place. His whole family came out to the show. You know, it, it was yeah. it's amazing. He wasn't even playing. You know, wow. it became really uh, supportive. You know, it was like Dave's playing, so we're going to come support him. It was incredible, and that That's was because so nice. Mickey. They were like, yeah. you know, Mickey. That that came from somewhere. You know, it's folks yeah. were wonderful and his late great brother george was fantastic as well oh that's yeah i, I never met him but i, I and yeah. it, re, whenever i talk to you and we we talk about mickey it reminds me i need to reach out to the guy and i haven't yeah. spoken with him in a while so yeah, yeah. He, yeah. He, you know, he didn't go on tour i was you know i was shocked to see that you know they didn't he didn't want to go out this year but hey you know it's yeah. uh, he, he's been out forever and it was time for him to to take a break a bit and i get it i totally yeah. get that I get yeah. that. Too. Get a little beat up out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Well, let's, you know, just, you know, I have so many things I want to talk about and, and, you know, we'll, we'll. God, I'm really uh, ADD. I'm going to, we're going to be all over no, the place. No, it's okay. It's okay. But I, I, I want to spend a little more time talking about the Hooters because I think most people right. watching this, of course, associate you with, with that band and the success yeah. and all the years you guys have been together. And again, I think of you guys as being around like at the, you know, the first record came out in 85, right? 85, 86? That was our first major record, Nervous first Night. Major, Nervous Night. We, we, we did an independent record in 83 after they did this uh, Cindy Lauper's record. Rob wrote Time After Time. Yeah, that's right. Cindy yeah. and uh, the, the, those, Rob and Eric played all over the record. Rick produced it, but those guys helped them in a great way. When yeah. they got, when they finished that record, which took them about six or seven months, uh, they called me up and said they want to put the band back together and we a couple other guys we recruited to join the band and they made an independent record uh, we made a record independent record called Omore and um, it sold uh, like over 100,000 copies we were, we were playing all the time Fantastic. for an independent record without any kind of label we got distribution but it it it, it did amazing you know in the area uh, Philadelphia Washington some in Boston because we used to come up there and play but mm -hmm. it did really well for us and then we got signed to Columbia um you know it didn't hurt that they that Rob wrote time after time and and yeah. those kinds of things happened so they signed us and in 85 we made that record Nervous Night which I didn't think honestly I I was 
I was nervous whether or not I was going to play on that record because Anton was doing everything. Yeah. When I was yeah. like, when we come to the record plan, do you know, he was playing on everything. And, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that if I didn't have a great day when I came in to cut that, those, you know, I remember those four tracks that I cut the first day on that record. Um, <laughs> they would have become Mr. Fig. Can you come over, please? <laughs> You know, because well, he stopped and he came to hear it and he really loved it. So that was yeah. pretty intimidating at the same time. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I, I got to think, I, I, who am I to say this, but having the drummer in the band who incidentally oh. can play his butt off. Yeah. Um, oh, that, well, that's thank the, you. Yeah. Thank the you. chemistry of having all that. I And I, you're right. Anton is Anton. I mean, he's a great, yeah. Yeah. solid guy that can come in. But but uh, I, I, I have, I have uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not surprised in the least that yeah. That you did I didn't know that though. I was, uh, you know, at the time I, I, I didn't know. I was like, well, because I'd hear records and I made records, I was making records, but I, not on that level, it changed, it, everything changed. You know, we got up there, the record plant studio B, that famous room, you know, we had Bill Whitman yeah, engineering, sure. Rick, Rick producing it, it, it. I just felt like, it just felt a little more, like I had a little more pressure, you know, although yeah. I, you know, but, and I was accepting fact, if I didn't cut it, then because those things happened a lot back then. Yeah, and it, sure. fortunately it worked out. A lot. And that, was that, that day, I think I recorded And We Danced, Day by Day, Where Do the Children Go? And there was another song from that, from that album that I cut all the same day. Wow. Crazy. Yeah, they yeah. all became good songs. You know, And We Danced, I, I, you know, I love that song. I've been listening to it knowing we're going to have this show today. And uh, it, I've like revisited because I, you know, it was on the radio nonstop MTV too. I want to talk about the impact that MTV had on you guys. Just a, and I mean, it had to have been a huge because they played that video so much and all you zombies. And uh, so, yeah. you know, all those. All There's those funny songs. stories about that. Even making the videos like all you zombies is the first time like that, that whole medium was a whole new, that was a different ball game. And, yeah. and, and we got a budget to make a video. We, they flew us to England, all you zombies. We were already recording. It was on the independent record and a, in a different version. It was faster and more of a ska thing that, and yeah. on the, on the, on the Columbia release, um, Rick wanted to slow it down a little bit and he, he had us listen to some Pink Floyd stuff. So even the bridge and the solo, we, we kind of made it more like, like a bigger wall of sound kind of thing. But uh, when we did the video, they hired Donald Camel, the guy that did the movie performance for oh, Mick yeah. Jagger. Yeah. And um, we did it in a, a, a pumping station, a water pumping station on the Thames River. And if you ever see the video, I, I'm on this, I'm on this, uh, uh, on, on this thing that is lowered, I don't know what you call it, like a stage with these chains coming down. It's being lowered from one level to the bottom. And initially, he wanted me to play. No offense, because I know you were at Simmons, but he wanted me to play a Simmons kit. <laughs> I said, no way, buddy. I, you, 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 I, and 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 we really had a, like a moment there. He's like, you know, I could just see it. And I said, from for some reason, I was just saying. Mm, you know, I just yeah. I play an acoustic kit. Can we just get like a four piece like Ringo kit up there? Trust me, I, I think it'll work. Thank goodness, because if we saw me yeah. coming from that video that day and I'd be sitting around a couple of tiles, I'd be, you know, it was the time. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't yeah. going for you know. It's, it's, yeah. But it's interesting you say that because that was such a, like a uh, image back then too, was like, yeah, yeah even, even if the record was recorded on acoustic drums, they'd put Simmons yeah. ads in the videos because yeah. it was like yeah. the hip trendy yeah. thing. Yeah, it wow. definitely more the thing. I just, I just, I don't know. I just wanted to play the acoustic kid. Maybe I was one of the hide behind there, you know. I didn't want <laughs> like jumping around and stuff. But I, at the same time, it was, uh, uh, I, I, I remember that was the only time I really made a fuss about anything. Give me a real kid, will you? That's great. I'm glad you yeah. did. And so, all you, yeah. let me ask you, David. All you, all you zombies, that is um, the bass drum on that. Is is that like a sampled bass drum, or is that an acoustic bass drum that's? Well, interestingly about that track, actually, we cut that in pieces. The, the original, if you hear the original, it's, it's the same beat. We just slowed it down and yeah. it's a bass drum. It it's it's bass. Yeah. playing the bass drum and the cross stick I did, uh, you know, I'm doing the, the cross stick. I, I, I overdubbed that and yeah. I did the hi-hat because there's that, you'll hear the Lind Roger Lind machines going, <laughs> you hear that little sound. It's like yeah. a wench thing over that. And, and I'm playing this like, I, I basically stole the drum beat from Linton Quasi Johnson, who was a reggae guy. It was kind of like a Sly Dunbar beat where you're just playing a backbeat. Like, mm, 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 mm. 
It's a it. great but beat, man. Bass drum. Wow. Yeah, it was great. And it worked great with the bridge too, because when I recorded that, I recorded it in pieces. And then uh, except for the, the, uh, 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 the solo in the bridge, because then it kind of turns into like a halftime feel that I play through that, yep. but I cut that with the whole kit. And the other one, I just cut in pieces, you know, and then I overdubbed the, um, I had to over figure out what I was doing live with it and then overdub it with the snare drum where I took the bottom off the snare and tweaked it up real, you know, real high and then used that. If people say, oh, that timbali, it wasn't a timbali, it was just a snare without, without the uh, bottom head on it. Oh, wow, man. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, yeah. so that bass drum is, is an acoustic bass drum that's just, yes. that just reverbed yeah. and, and, mm -hmm. oh and, yeah. 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 Yeah, what that's a sound, it. man. Yeah, yeah. Sound. yeah, Bill Whitman, man. Bill Whitman was just uh, terrific. There were two, a couple of different engineers on that, but Bill Whitman and, and the great John Anyelid, he he actually, when we decided it needed a solo and a bridge, I went I went back, you know, and, you know, it's different than Pro Tools back in those days. He had to cut right. the tape, and I had to go cut it And you know, when, when they, uh, you know, put the tape back together, and I had to, you know, I had to overdub that, and and uh, we put the click on, and I just I just cut it. I was just going to say because with the Lin, with with it, you had you had to play to a click. Obviously, you had to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you, did you have much experience at that point, or no? With, with, say, do a click track? No. Yeah. I mean, I do it all. It's funny. I do it all the time. Even with the Hooters, I do it live these days. They they like everything so consistently. Our our shows at about 95 percent of that show is all to a click, and on which I run off my SBDSX. Uh, but but back then. Uh, when I heard that click, it was again another, you know, was a bit intimidating because I was just sure. always playing music and then put the click up and two bars and you were in, you know, that's and I uh, had to get used to it real quick. <laughs> yeah, but you got to have some some good body, you know, like, yeah. you know, internal clock chops to be able to yeah. just. Yeah. you know that quickly i always to played play on play. top of it though that was all even when i listened to those old recordings like those days you know we couldn't go i remember on the second album when we did satellite there's a bass drum now that every time i hear it i go mm, why if we had pro tools we could have nudged that a little bit but you know everything was uh you know click and we're hearing it you know i remember the first time i used a russian dragon i could really see and i was at arden i could see how you know in, in certain spots i was pulling behind or you know that kind of <laughs> thing. But that's what makes it feel real but but uh yeah. you know it's different nowadays we, we can see those transients and see where you're at you know it's all a different story yeah but yeah man the click was something that uh we we used because we used to do like to have multiple takes of of, of, of a song so if they want to move things they could do it let's play it can we play a little bit of that song yeah yeah, please. yeah yeah sure let's let's do it man this is yeah and this is from the from the um the nervous columbia night. from nervous right. night yeah release. so it's yeah, gonna be yeah there. this was a cute a lot the live aid story on this one's pretty good yeah i want i want to get to live aid too after yeah. this for sure yeah this is my this is my end I down lead off of that glyph. Yes. Beautiful groove, man. It's fun. It's fun.
<laughs> Man. Yeah. It's a fun song to play live. It's oh, really fun yeah. To it's it's got to be. Fun to play. Oh, when we did yeah. that at Live Aid, um, so we were the first rock band to get on stage at Live Aid. And, in, and I was the only one wearing in ears. And I was sometimes I would wear them, sometimes I wouldn't, because I was beta testing them for Marty Garcia. And uh, that day I just decided, you know, I'm, I'm going to put on the ears today because I sat in front of the, I, I would set up uh, kind of like on, on stage left and, uh, on the side there. And I, mm. and I knew that with no monitor check, oh, this could be dangerous. Yeah. yeah. So I popped the ears in because I cued off of that gliss. My world played play the gliss, but I, I wore the ears that day. And, 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 and Bob Clear Mountain was in the truck mixing the show. And he never heard us before. He didn't know anything about all you zombies. So he had samples for the snare drums for everybody's for the show. So I start playing the click. And all of a sudden, he, you know, I heard the story that he's in the truck just going, what the hell is going on? He's like, and he goes, oh, my God, the drummer's hitting the cross stick through that thing. Because in the beginning, if you, there are, I, mean, I think they might have fixed it. But for a while on some YouTube videos, you can hear, da, da, you can hear the backbeat of a snare drum playing. Uh, that, that, uh, that you know oh, so no kidding yeah, wow. oh yeah 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 it's kind of crazy but oh my uh, gosh. yeah he didn't know anything about it but uh but yeah and uh, and also what what i did too is uh, on that crash on that cymbal crash out of the yeah on, on the chorus there that i did with a mallet and a and a, and a 20 inch ride cymbal from zildjian i hit that and recorded that to give me that and, and for a while there uh in the 80s i would use a sample of um I do I'd have a pad with a sample of a gong in it that's what I used to do I see yeah so you'd play that as yeah because it's it's yeah I and again I wondered it it's it sounds so ahead of its time like in terms of this sonically like all the things that you were doing in 1985 that people do now like yeah all the time all the time but but it was like I'm thinking like man he was like really ahead of the times with the sampling you know the sounds and the and the yeah like we were all part. into that and i think rick rick really was kind of always thinking ahead of the curve because i remember uh it was i don't think it was on that record but the following record i started making samples for him like he would come in like nobody would be there and he'd be just recording samples of like just different sounds and different beats and I, I didn't know what he was doing he said hey can you come and play some beats for me just play a shuffle and those kinds of things and he was taking those and you know then he would build like rhythms and like loops that we would play to it was pretty cool, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Joe the Butcher from uh, from Rough House, he was doing that all the time. I mean, I was playing on a, a lot of that stuff. They were just building loops with it. You know, it was crazy. Cool stuff. But it was, yeah, a little ahead of the time. Really, really great. I mean, your feel on that song, David. Yeah, thank you. Like, it's, oh, you're thank welcome, you. man. It's it's thank so you. killer. It's just, yeah. I mean, talk about yeah. in the Slide pocket. Dunbar. That's, <laughs> well, it's like Dunbar yeah, Carling but, Battery. <laughs> But you, gotta, to you got, I know you obviously do because you got to be able to really like get in that zone. You know what I mean? Get in that, that head to play like that, to have it feel so natural like that. Yeah. It's hard to fake the, that, that kind of reggae feel. You either yeah. got it or you don't, I think, you know, you, it's like, you, it, you know, okay. You understand how, how it play it, but you have to, I think, you know, if you don't really feel it, uh, you have to, and if you're having trouble with it, I think you need to really like immerse yourself in it all so you right. can get into it because it's got to feel natural. It's almost like playing a blues shuffle, but a different thing, you know, like, you know, you're playing the blues, you feel it yeah. and a reggae thing, you know, you gotta, you gotta feel it. I mean, obviously you can learn it, but it's something that, you know, played best is really knowing what you're doing with that stuff. Yeah. hundred percent. No, you said it perfectly because it, the sticking is one thing, like, you know, you can, you, the sticking, I won't say it's simple, but it's what you're playing, you know, it's obvious what you put, it's the feel, yeah. it's to have that, that integrity, you know what I mean? Well, thank that, you. That real thank authentic. You. I yeah. appreciate that, you know, yeah. I appreciate that. I, and then you've had Andy Newmark on a bunch of times. He's another guy I would listen to because he played a lot of cross stick, you know, yeah. later yeah. on, like a lot of recordings I would hear, he would go back from the backbeat to a cross stick and it just seemed so natural for him. It, it just seemed like, you know, nothing. And, and, and I, he was good at that too. Yeah. He's, yeah. I mean, he's a lot of those guys like Rick and, and Andy, like from that era, Russ Kunkel, oh. you know, could, oh. could move from cross yes. stick to backbeat really oh, comfortably. Yeah, Jim incredible, Gordon. Yeah. incredible stuff. Yeah. Incredible stuff. Well, I want to play another song from that record. Yeah. Cool. Um, and, and uh, you might recognize this song. Uh, I love this song. Were all these songs 
they weren't cut to a click track. They were all cut live. Well, that well that song. All, oh, that, that was, all of them. All of them were cut. I, I was cutting to a click. You were okay. okay. Yeah, with the band. I mean, we, we usually so. Well, on Nervous Night, it, Nervous Night, it was uh, when I said Nervous Night was Eric Robin and myself in the studio, and yeah. and and we would Eric would come out with his guitar. They Roger Lynn would turn on, and boom, a couple bars, and we were in. That's how it went, you know. Okay. Sometimes we, we he'd be teaching me the song. Uh, I think if it's you know, well, I want to hear what you're playing. But okay, uh, you'll know bro. this song. I think you'll know this song. Yeah. Right, I do had to stay out of the way on that one you know <laughs> stay out of the way and just i remember it just like just lay it down and stay out of the way and let the song be the song you know and i mean the way it it, it, it you know that with those guys that that's yeah. what i try to do it's like well i i you know I, I think you're being very humble because the way i i every time i hear this song and when i first heard it and just listening to it again today yeah. It, your your use of dynamics it's like a oh, it's it's, it's, it's a master class really yeah. the way oh, thank you yeah absolutely thank you, you thank build you. it and you know you, you bring it down you build it back up now that's eric playing bass on this song probably yeah, yeah. yeah. eric's a great bass player yeah he played Man, bass what a great bass player yeah. what a great bass you know, line 
oh my god he's 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 incredible on that and and he uh, and but his and his guitar riff his riff is that like i remember when i was cutting i i remember to this day cutting that he had that junior he's out there near me we're in studio b at the record plant and um you know i there was the click and i remember he had the guitar riff was what got me through you know because it's consistent you know it was almost yeah, like a sequence yeah. you know but he was playing it live he's such a great player and then he laid down that bass you know the bass wasn't the bass was i think it was just me him and i uh, might have yeah, but I just remember him and I cutting that. I, That's was, so ta- his bass part is so tasty and yeah, and us together. But uh, but I mean the way great. yeah the way you and I I'll admit this if it were me playing that song David I would I would want to rush the shit out of it because yeah. there's so it, much excitement it, in that it, song. But when you when you're feeling the song and you're hearing it and you're hearing the lyrics and you're hearing what's going on you know you you, you, you might have done exactly what I did you know you're feeling it and you're getting into the song I mean if. If you allow yourself to hear what's happening there, the music yeah, when you're yeah. recording and you let it yourself feel it, that's when those dynamics can happen. You know, it's like, you yeah. know, it's like I was such a, I was a fan of their writing. I still am. <laughs> it's why I'm still, <laughs> like, oh, you guys still got me in the group. You know, it's like it, it's great. Uh, and and listen, they're they're super cool and they 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 know what I bring to the table. But it, I still am am so grateful that they still are doing stuff and working on stuff like they were back then. Yeah, so yeah. I, 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 I really enjoy it. And the songs are fun to play. They're a lot of fun to play live. I mean, I got to go out. Last year we did like 60 dates. It was a lot of work for us and uh, United yeah. States, Europe, and we're going to go out to Europe. We'll do 25 dates in Europe and we play, play all that stuff live. And, and we try to bring the same energy we did as we did when we recorded that stuff back in 1985. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it's I'll, fun. I'll bet you I got a credit. I was really like Liberty DeVito's a friend of mine. And I would go see Lib play with uh, with Billy when every time came to Philly. And I didn't know him at the time, but just the way he would play, I forget what song, Pressure. I remember yeah. there was a song we, we did a cover of the um of the uh, Arthur Lee and Love song. Um uh, um, and I forget the title, it's on our record, but I remember I visualized Liberty, how he would play, and I played it like, I want to play, what would Lib do here? And I want to play it like that. <laughs> I think that's a lot of drummers, I go, okay, I want to be me, but I really like what he yeah, would have done. Yeah, yeah, No, I know what you mean. Sometimes yeah. you, you put yourself in, like, how would, you know, in this guy's head, and, yeah. Um, but I, Try. yeah, I, it's got to be so much fun to play those songs, because the crowd, ah, the crowd must awesome. go out of their minds when they hear those songs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they do. They 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 yeah. they love that song and it all the, the nervous night. That's like the gift that keeps giving. Yeah, that record. I yeah. I uh, I I love being able to play that. And uh, so yeah, we have fun doing it, and it's part of our set every time we play. Last week we were doing that that kind of '80s show in on Palm Springs. Uh, um, I think I told you it's Smithereens, uh, Berlin, and us. We played, and a lot of that stuff that we were doing in our set was from Nervous Night. Yeah. Sometimes we do a different set. We play those songs in Europe, but we had other songs that were hit records over in Europe that didn't do, didn't do anything in America. Yeah. Isn't that funny? I get arrested with it. (laughs) (laughs) But it's nice to be able to do that, to go to Europe and and play like maybe the stuff that you're not playing all the time here. And and, yeah, I had to learn German for God's sake, Johnny. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's been time over there i did like learn how to order a cup of coffee go to find a bathroom <laughs> yeah, yeah oh that's yeah. so funny well let's yeah. let's take let's take a, a few minutes and talk about um in the pocket this yeah. other project that you have yeah. that's that's really it looks to be a really cool and exciting project you're paying homage to all love. these great bands from philly yeah. and yeah. yeah so how did that get started well as you know i for for uh when i was living on the west coast uh, I, I moved down to San Diego and I just kind of got lucky. I, ended up, I was doing a session for an attorney there that was working for a company called mp3.com. And uh, I, uh, you know, they needed somebody to help them manage the music there. I didn't know anything. I couldn't even open up a laptop back then, you know, barely. <laughs> but, you know, I had a website, but it, it was static. I would show it to people. And uh, I ended up going to work for this company and I learned a, a bit about technology and, you know, operating systems and things like that. And we were managing music that was, you know, later on would be streamed and downloaded and things like that. But uh, I used to have a, uh, a, a, a little e-zine they used to call called the uh, uh, Essential Songs of Rock and Pop. There were two different, you know, genres that I would f- find the music because only about 1% of the music that came in there was good. You know, it was, the rest was pretty horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, 
after I, I after I left there, uh, um, I was working with a guy named Guy Eckstein, Billy Eckstein, the great jazz singer, his son, Guy yeah. Eckstein, the drummer. He was handling the jazz. I was doing the, the rock and pop. Um, he, he, he said, you got to call your thing in the pocket because you're the drummer and you play in the pocket. Mm -hmm. So I took the name, I, I, you know, when I moved back to Philly and uh, uh, my, my wife and, and I were taking a walk from Rittenhouse Square one day in Philadelphia from moving from Philly and coming back after 20 years, the city made a drastic change and just the whole vibe of it, you know, the, 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 you know, it just was a different place. And I loved it so much. And, and I started thinking about the, the kind of music that came out of there. And, and I just started thinking of a project. And my wife said, why don't you start recording songs? And, uh, uh, you know, so I had some friends with studios and I reached out to them. And I, um, you know, I, I basically, because the MP3 and digital music was, you know, exploding, we were missing that, you know, that aspect of picking up a record or reading liner notes, oh, yeah. and knowing who played on the song and who yeah. engineered the song. I was, I was, I love that kind of stuff. So I, every track that we recorded of our tribute to Philly songs, I did a video where we would ex talk about the song, talk about, you know, just any kind of information we got to inform people, you know, that like to know more about why the song was made. And, and basically, you know, I've been, you know, I've been doing this for, I think we're coming up on 15 years. We've recorded uh, like coming up on 24 tracks and we not only record rock songs, but I, I pay homage to, you know, Philly International. Uh, people, I don't know if people know, but Disco Inferno was recorded in, at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Sigma Sound with the Tramps and Earl Young, the great Earl Young. And yeah. so I can talk about these guys in these videos. One I think I sent you is the great OJs. They had this great song called Backstabbers that we recorded with my, my, my good friend, Richie and Charlie, Richie, rest in peace. He, I mean, Charlie from the Soul Survivors, who does a song called Expressway. Love I grabbed that song. To sing yeah. the track. Yeah, Express Me to Your Heart. It's a great song. Um, so they came and sang. So I basically record with musicians that I normally don't get to work with. I bring them in the studio and we find a song to do. And uh, this uh, Backstabbers is one of them that we recorded. Uh, that's one of the one of the ITP songs. And and is it it's you and it's you on drums? I'm playing drums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a okay. video for it. There's a video for it, and there's a little bit of mini history lesson. If you go to songsinthepocket.org, you can see there's a little history lesson on the song and and the OJ's and and Richie and Charlie and and uh, I I just I do the project. I mean, we not only have that song, but we did Punk Rock Girl by the Dead Milkmen. Uh, uh, we we paid on, we uh, honored Young Americans because David Bowie recorded Young Americans at at uh, um, Sigma Sound in 1973. And it was like a big thing in Philadelphia that Bowie yeah. was. You know. I think Andy Newmark's on that song too, right? I I, I believe so. I, I think so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, incredible. Well, I'm I'm gonna play this song. I love the yeah. OJ's. I was so psyched when you sent this to me. Oh, cool. And, and yeah, I like uh, this version. Yeah, yeah, and what a what a great faithful version you guys did too. Yeah. And this is thank this you. Is killer. Yeah. Here we yeah. go. Check it out.
they do it. That was a fun session. That was another one who was set up live in the room and cut it. You could see that on the, at the, the website. It was great. Um, classic songs. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. I'll put the link in there for sure. Yeah. 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 I just recorded a new one. I, 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 there's a, there we had a, I thought, you know, when I was a kid, I thought if you heard it on the radio here, it was, it was big everywhere. There was an artist out of Phil, actually he was from Jersey. His name was Billy Harner. They used to call him the human percolator. 1968 had a song called Sally saying something. And um, so I've always loved the song, but I, you know, it was like a hit, I guess in areas, regional parts of America. So that's my latest, that's our latest one. I have a horn okay. section. And uh, I brought in Adam Wiener, who's the singer in a band called Luca Connie. He's singing and he's like the human, the, the new version of the human percolator. <laughs> <laughs> it's what, a, fun. What, a, what an awesome project. You must be having fun. a blast, man. Yeah, yeah. I, have a, I have fun doing it. You know, I wish I could do it more, but hey, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, People, friends of mine still want to participate in it. And, you know, I have friends of mine with recording studios that, you know, bring us in and we have a blast. Yeah. It's great. It's absolutely great. It's That's great. Stuff. And it's, I think it's so great what you're doing too, to like keep that music, you know, I mean, keeping it, it's out there, but you're keeping it in the, in the present day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought that was a interesting, that was a, a part of the project that I found that, uh, 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 something later that there were people that didn't know uh, the history of certain songs. And uh, I thought that was re really good that we could share that with, with people. And there were younger people that were hearing it and, and, and digging it. You know, it was, it was yeah. really a lot of fun to do. I, I, I love being in, involved with it and driving it. It's great. It's great. great. I lead, I'm like the leader of that band. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> You know, obviously you have the passion for it, but like you have yes. all the knowledge too. You know, right. you're like yeah. an encyclopedia of all this stuff. Well, yeah, well, I, I uh, you know, that's the one thing that comes along with, uh, and thank you, by the way, uh, one of the things about, you know, experience, you know, yeah. and, 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 I, and I love the read and I love the, I love history and I love finding it about, finding out about other musicians and, and of course, watching what's happening now with new music and, and bands that are coming up, you know, so it's like, um, but uh, the, the history of, 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 of music and certainly in where I grew up around here, it, there's, there's so much. And, 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 you know, sometimes I'm still surprised, you know, we had the late, there was a guy that had a, a, a dance TV show named Jerry Blavitt that was here that uh, when Todd 
we, there's a little Philadelphia Walk of Fame thing that they have here that Todd Rundgren was, he inducted us into that. And he was talking about how all he listened to back in the day was Jerry Blavitt. You know, that's how he got his, like, his yeah. thing. You know, it's, uh, it's something that I, 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 because I had an opportunity um, uh, to, um, to do because of the Hooters, I, I figured, hey, you know, put my time into a good project. So That's it's been great, a lot man. of fun. Yeah, it's been great. You know, I mean, and there's Philly is so rich with music history too. You know, I mean, there's there really is totally. a Philly sound. It's a real yeah. thing, and yeah, and yeah, yeah. You guys are are blessed yeah. to have that. You know, totally, totally. And it's funny, my my uh, my Rob Hyman, who's the keyboard player, and writes a lot of songs with the Hooters. He has a studio, uh, not it's like five minutes from my where where I live, and. Uh, and then there's Studio Four, which is great. Used, they used to all be down in the city, but everything's kind of moved out to the suburbs. And there's less, fewer and fewer places like that these days. You know, every, yeah. everything's at home. I mean, I got a studio downstairs that I work out of. You know, but I, I always like when I get a chance to to go to a, an actual recording studio. I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. It's great. How about like I'm reading the, the you had uh, the Jim Gordon book. Book. I'm reading that right now. You are, I mean, yeah. It's pretty heavy, isn't it? It's yeah. You know, those days were, you know, amazing, and uh, his story is remarkable. And it's like you are providing such an amazing uh, a service for everybody. I mean, it's really great, Johnny, that you're having these authors come on here and talk about that. You know, I know you, Robin, on, you know, talking about Jeff. Yeah. And who I never had a chance to meet. I would have loved to meet him. Um, I just moved to LA at the time, and right. uh, and uh, you know, you had Joel on there. That, that was amazing. I mean, yeah. this is stuff that a lot of drummers need to know. These, I mean, I think I know. the history well, of. Thanks uh, for of, mentioning of where they come from. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning th both of those authors and those books. And speaking of Robin, you know, she has a new book out. Uh, yes. Jeff Picaro stories. And, and, uh, I have a copy of it. Great. It's going to be on the show. I think we're going to do the show on April 1st. Fantastic. Which would have been Jeff's 70th birthday. Wow. So when I mentioned wow. it to Robin, yeah. she loved the idea and I, I think it's going to work for our schedule. So Great. we'll, we'll give a little sneak, you know, shout out on that one that, uh, Robin yeah. Flans will be returning. So, oh, that'd be great. And I, I know you're very close with Simon Phillips too. You know, I mean, I got to know him a bit from touring around over the years, and with the Hooters, have done shows with Toto. So he's always a guy that I've like had dinner with and and hung out with. And what a what a sweet human being that he's, guy. He really uh, is. He's he's just he's the greatest. You know, we sometimes don't talk to each other for a, a couple of months, and we'll we just missed each other in London a few months back, but. Um, but, you know, we sort of pick it right up where we left off, you know, and it's and it's always Simon's always like, so when are we going to when are we going to, uh, you know, have dinner together? Like, when yeah. is that going to happen? When are you coming to L.A.? And it's like, oh, I'm not coming to L.A. in any time soon. And but he's such a just such a, he's great, a bit of a foodie, you know, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he is. He, he is. Yeah. How's he not walking around like 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 this? You know, I, I know like, it's because he, the way it's the way he plays. He's such a oh, physical my, drummer. I oh, know. my goodness. Man. I know. But, you know, speaking of that, I, I, I mentioned the other day when we were talking, I remember um, in 1989 also when I first met you that summer with the Hooters. And then a couple of months later, I was in L.A. for the Buddy Rich Memorial Concert that Zildjian produced. Eesh. And, yeah, we were we had the big show was at the Wiltern Theater, October of 89. Yeah. And then we're having the after party at the Hyatt on Sunset. And I yeah. bumped into you who was you yes. were staying there right at the hotel. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think I was I, I, I think I just moved, moved to L.A. Oh, okay. And okay. I remember I, I can't remember. I Usually that's where we stayed. But I ran into you and then you yeah. introduced me to Steve, which was like meeting, you know, it's like meeting God, <laughs> you yeah. know. Oh, my yeah. goodness. And he was such a sweetheart of a guy, you know, and his yeah. life like was just, you know, just going that way. And he was doing great. So that was I, I really no, I'll never forget that. Oh, know? well, that was, was to a lot of guys. Uh, Myron, uh, uh, Myron yeah. became my neighbor later. Uh, he lived in I moved to Woodland Hills and he introduced me to all those guys at that Woodland Hills drum club. I met a bunch of guys there. And they were always so great. That's um, what Myron does. Yeah. He welcomes you to the to the neighborhood, to the family. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was. He lived very close to me, so and he was a great guy. He introduced me to a bunch of people, and we just, uh, you know, every time I seen him, it's uh, Tyrone. He was so Tyrone. Yeah, he's, he's Tyrone. the best. Tyrone <laughs> Brownbacker, I know. And he, I, and I remember I was just getting to know Steve at that time. Steve Gad, we're talking about, and I remember, um, you know, being in that room, and and we'd spent like a week out there 
like rehearsals and all that stuff for it. And, and, uh, you know, like, like you were, and like, I think everybody that meets him for the first time, I, and I've met him a long time before that, but, right. uh, and I realized just how incredibly down to earth and sweet and humble he is. And, yeah. and, and he'd be, you know, he'd come over to me and say like, how, how does it sound? Does that sound okay? Or, you know, like, I'm like, <laughs> you're asking me how, how it yeah. sounds or how the drums sound, you know? Yeah. And then of course yeah. we went on to become great friends and, yeah, and uh, that blows me away that you, you get that kind of relationship with them that's, oh, that's that's fantastic and i i just watch i i don't know if he's still running but i know that you know like i'm i'm having my knee uh i'm having a uh, uh my knee scoped and i have a torn meniscus and i had to have a hip replacement and like drumming like it you know yeah. and it's all the playing it wasn't it's not because i play football it was like playing the drums you know you sure, get, like, yeah. and i remember when i was seeing him he was he was running a lot which blew me away because it was a few years not you know not that yeah. long ago, he still is, does i think not as much but but he still does get out yeah it yeah. does absolutely yeah. but you got to keep your heart going you have to right. you have to you know i try to get to you know take care of myself so i can like last week when i played that gig i only had to play for an hour uh, and our, we had some issues on stage monitors I we, we used in ears and it was wasn't sounding like it should but i it's a couple of times on there like oh, holy cow you know <laughs> and we it's, and we die you know it's like that kind of stuff is well, it's a little bit of work you know so yeah. it's, it's a physical people. instrument and you know yeah. you yeah. certainly make it physical too i've seen well, you know also they want me to play they want me to play a drum solo every <laughs> night which is what did i get myself into i don't <laughs> this like what you know, so, yeah, People it's great. Love it. Yeah, the show must go on, and they're the bosses. They say, "Can you do that?" I said, "Well, I'll try." And I thought they were they're like, "Oh, this is really bad." And they go, "We're going to put it in the center." I keep on trying to say, "Well, you want to put something else?" I said, "No, this is your drum part. You're going to go." Gosh. <laughs> Stop already! You're going to oh. try. I think they're trying to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome, well, man! This has been so great. It's been fun. Oh. Been fun. Absolutely, Johnny. I uh, thank you. I, I was I, when I saw the email come from you. I was like, "Wow!" Uh, because oh. I, I love what you're doing, and, you. and and I know how hard it is to do this. So we'll, we'll chat about it. It's a difficult thing to put it all together and all the prep work. I hope your friends know how hard you work to put this together to bring us such joy. It's well, awesome. Thank you, David. Awesome. Man, you you make it really easy. I mean, this this has been so fun and I've been so looking forward and so overdue and having you too. So well, thank you. So, thank Anytime, you. man. It was it was it was a gas, man. It was a lot of fun. And good luck with the surgery and, and thank uh, you. yeah, thank rest you. up after that. And yeah. and uh, we'll stay in touch. And in the meantime, I, yeah, well, thank everybody for watching and listening. Yeah. Big hand for David Wasikinen. Thank you. Thanks, buddy, guys. And thank uh, you. We'll see you all soon. All right, man. Bye bye. All right. Well, that's my show. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did give it a like, leave me a comment. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done that already. And the podcast is available on all the podcast platforms. So download it. And remember, no drummers are ever harmed on live from my drum room or track talk and drummers when in doubt, leave it out. All right. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you again real soon. See ya.